We continue our study of the Gospel of John. We're finishing up with John chapter 4. We left off last week, I believe, at verse 43. And we will uh, venture on into this Gospel. And we find after the events that are described in John 4 with the woman at Samaria, uh, we have a shift of emphasis. Before we completely leave, though, that... uh, that narrative about the Samaritan, wo- I mean the Samarian woman, not the Samaritan woman, the Samarian woman, woman of Samaria. Uh, we need to understand that because of what happened, because of Jesus' conversation with her, because of the fact that she brought so many to Jesus, that this broke down the walls of prejudice that existed, helped at least to break down the walls that were already in place. It uh, also elevated women, just for the simple fact that Jesus spoke to this woman, women being despised in the eyes of many in the first century. Uh, Jesus elevated women to the status that they uh, should have. And then also, he uh, lifted up those who are in sin in the sense that he gave them hope and gave them opportunity to receive forgiveness. Not, ele- not elevating their sin, mind you, but elevating the possibility that they could be redeemed. Uh, for those and many other reasons, this uh, incident that is, uh, this conversation and this uh, whole narrative that is listed in John chapter 4 uh, should give hope to so many people who think they have no hope who think there is no hope at all for forgiveness. They can can simply look at this situation and find that if Jesus could forgive this woman in her circumstances and change her life, he can change anyone's life. That's a very important message to get across. So now we come to verse 43 of John chapter 4. And it says, Simply after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. Now we find in Luke chapter 4, Another perspective from Luke's inspired account when he says that Jesus went into Galilee, he returned, that is, in the power of the Spirit. Uh, And he, of course, came with some fame in, in connection with that, as Luke records. Many people came to hear him because of what he had been doing. And so uh, that sort of sets the, the, uh, the scene for what we're about to see here. Jesus himself testified, verse 44, that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. This statement that Jesus made, a prophet has no honor in his own country, is found in all three gospel accounts besides John. You can find it in Matthew chapter 13, verse 57, and Mark chapter 6, verse 4, and Luke chapter 4, verse 24, and here in John chapter 4, verse 44. A prophet has no honor in his own country. Now at this moment, Jesus was returning to Galilee with great fame. But Jesus put all of this in perspective. And this statement that Jesus makes is so, so true, is it not? What's the old saying? You can't go home again. That's so true in so many ways. Well, Jesus knew that his own people would reject him. And so, verse 45, then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. This nobleman is not named, but he was likely an officer of Herod Antipas. He was a man of some position, of some uh, renown politically. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. That tells me a lot about this man. Even though he was a political figure, even though he was a man of some authority, He still had high regard for Jesus Christ. Neither circumstance, age, or situation uh, would uh, guarantee his joy. He realized this. He wanted his uh, son healed. He had to seek Jesus Christ. And the same way with us. Circumstances don't guarantee joy. Age does not guarantee joy. Situation doesn't guarantee joy. We've got to seek out Jesus Christ. 
to find true joy. And this man had this instinct. If he could just find Jesus, his situation would be rectified. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He was testing him. He wanted them to believe his words. He didn't just want them to believe in his miracles. He wanted all of the people, including this nobleman, to believe in what he was saying. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. He didn't just want Jesus healing. He wanted the presence of Jesus. He wanted Jesus to come to his house. He had that much trust at least in the power of Jesus to heal him. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Notice that, how Jesus puts it. Go your way, your son lives. As soon as Jesus said those words, his son regained his life. Jesus' words had that much power. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. This is likely after the sun had gone down when he met his servants. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend or get better. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was in the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. He realized, as soon as Jesus had said those words, his son lived. And because of that, he had faith in Christ. He first believed in Jesus' presence. Then he believed in Jesus' words. And finally, he believed in Jesus himself. That's the progression of this man's faith. This is again, John adds, the second miracle or sign that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Notice something very interesting about this. One small sign and many people were converted in Samaria. One small sign, that is, telling the woman about her situation, having never met her. One small sign, many people converted. Yet two great miracles were performed so far in Galilee, and only one household is converted. Isn't that something? Two great miracles, one household, and yet one small sign in Samaria, and many converted. That's very, very telling at this point. Even though Jesus is getting crowds, even though people are coming to hear him, still they haven't developed that kind of trust in his words at this point. So now we come into chapter 5. And let me say right at this moment that from chapters 5 through 10, this whole section of John, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we are going to be reading and seeing some fascinating events and, and reading some fascinating statements that Jesus makes. In fact, it is my opinion that one of the big reasons why liberal scholarship rejects the Gospel of John is because of that entire section, John chapters 5 through 10. Because if you reject what Jesus says in John chapters 5 through 10, you've rejected Christ completely. There's no hope for you. There's absolutely no hope for you. What Jesus says in this section, in this entire section of the gospel, is profound in so many ways. And we're going to see some events that we're very familiar with, but I hope that when we go back and revisit those events and those people, you're going to be seeing some things that you hadn't seen before or maybe hadn't picked up on before. And I know in this section, in chapter 5, early on, you're, well, I'm going to be uh, presenting to you a proposal that you may have never even considered before. Uh, hopefully it's not going to be too off the wall. But at any rate, we'll get into chapter 5. It's nothing, nothing loopy, I guarantee. But anyway, we'll get in there and we'll see what we're talking about. Chapter 5, verse 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. When it says he went up to Jerusalem, he was literally going up to Jerusalem. You literally go up. 
You literally go up to Jerusalem. Just like when you're going up to Birmingham from Montgomery, you are literally going up. Not just going north, you're literally going up. If you've ever seen the topography of Alabama, you know that the further south you go, the more <laughs> downhill you go because you're getting closer and closer to the Gulf, relatively speaking. Well, in this case, in, in Palestine, when you go up to Jerusalem, you can be coming from the north and you're going up to Jerusalem. That's what was the case with Jesus. And the reason why he was going to Jerusalem is because it was of necessity. The Passover, this is the second Passover in Jesus' earthly ministry. Again, remember that the reason why we can uh, determine that Jesus had a three and a half year ministry approximately is because of what John says concerning the Passovers. We can, we can map, map it out chronologically by utilizing those time markers. And this is the second Passover that he attends during his life, or during his earthly ministry, that is. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, or the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now first, let me... Uh, notate something about the text, the Greek text here at the end of verse 3 and the entirety of verse 4. According to all of the evidence that we have, the manuscript evidence, the latter part of verse 3, that is, waiting for the moving of the water, and all of verse 4 were not in the original text. How do we know that? Because of the, of the manuscript evidence. There are so many manuscripts that are ancient, that go all the way back, some of them, to the second and third centuries, that do not include these, this verse, verse 4, and do not include the latter part of verse 3. That's the reason why you'll see in the American Standard Version, the latter part of verse 3 and all of verse 4 not there, because of the manuscript evidence. Now, why was that added? Because it was obviously a later edition, verse 4. Why was that added? There's been a lot of speculation as to why it was added. Uh, some have said that this was a superstition of the Jews and it was added by later scribes to explain what was going on and that's a possibility. But there's another possibility, I think. In the first century, in Ro the Roman Empire, there were a lot of Roman gods and goddesses. If you're familiar at all with the wor Roman world, you'll know that they had their own pantheon of gods and goddesses based in large part off of the Greek gods and goddesses. But there was one god in particular that was new to the Roman Empire. And it was possibly the most popular Roman god at this point. And it was the god Asclepius. Asclepius. Asclepius was the Roman god of healing. And in fact, all throughout the Roman Empire, there were Asclepions that were built. What were Asclepions? They were buildings built in honor of the god Asclepion in which healing was done, quote, unquote. Since Asclepius was the Roman god of healing, and I won't get into the background of it because it's too, too complex, still... Asclepians were, was where people would go and have a certain amount of money or food or belongings that they would devote to the Roman god Asclepius. They would then take a bath and then they would lie in a room there in the Asclepian to supposedly receive the healing that the god would give. Now what does this have to do with this? We have, not, or I say, us archaeologists have unearthed this very place, Bethesda, where the five porches are. What's interesting is in the description of this place by the Jewish authorities that are in place now in the state of Israel, they have named this place an Asclepion. Interesting. And the reason why it's interesting is because what you have here is scribes who have added verse 4 to try to explain what was happening. But was it perhaps for the reason that they didn't want people to realize that there was something else going on 
outside of Jerusalem. That is to say, there was an actual Asclepion right on the very outskirts of the city of Jerusalem itself. Now this puts into di a different perspective why Jesus came to this particular place to heal this particular man on this particular Sabbath day. If it is the case that this place, that is the pool, Bethesda, was a center of an Asclepion, then you have the divine Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, going into Satan's house, as it were, and demonstrating his power over the power of Satan in a very tangible and real sense. That's my conviction about what's going on here. Jesus, without saying a word against the place in general, just by what he does demonstrates that he is far superior to any superstition that anyone could ever present. Just by his power of healing. Now, having gotten all that out of the way, you can take that for what it's worth, take it or leave it. At any rate, that's my conviction about what's going on in the background here. Verse 5, here's the focus. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. So he either had rheumatism or he had paralysis. It just says he had an infirmity. He has, he's had this for 38 years. Uh, if he was in his 40s, it had been most of his life. Uh, almost all of his life, in fact. When he saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Notice that Jesus chooses a man of which there could be no question about him being healed. You see, in an, if this is an Asclepion, there were people who would go into Asclepions to be healed of headaches, of different uh, backaches and different pains, uh, or maybe even some psychosomatic pains. But this gentleman was obviously, obviously, physically incapacitated. Jesus singles him out and asks him the question, will you be made whole? It's to arouse this man from his despair and it's to awaken hope within him and also to see if he actually wanted to be healed. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. He's not offended at what Jesus says. He simply thinks that Jesus is wanting to assist him or escort him down into the pool. Well, he had a want of means, quite obviously. So what does Jesus say? Verse 8. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. This man had a mattress, a pallet, we would call it. He had a mattress that he laid upon he says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately, notice that, immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now you hear the dramatic music beginning to play. If this was a movie, you would hear the foreboding music in the background because now this is going to awaken the enemies of Christ even more but notice the process Christ spoke the man obeyed and he was made whole immediately now in, if this was an Asclepion as I presented a few minutes ago if this was this kind of a place these healings quote unquote that were done were prolonged healings that might be making the person better in his mind, maybe physically better, you know, just feeling better temporarily. But yet in this case, it was instantaneous. There's no doubt, no question about it. And it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Oh, yes. Verse 10. The Jews, therefore, said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Not lawful to carry his bed? We know that the Sabbath 
was prescribed in Exodus 20, verse 10. No work was to be done. It's a day of rest. Quite obviously, you're not doing any work as such. But we also know that the Sabbath day was the busiest day of the year for the Levitical priests. I mean, they worked even harder on the Sabbath day than they did any other day of the week. And there were certain things that could be done on the Sabbath day which were allowed by God. But here's the main point. This is human tradition that these Pharisees, these Jews are coming from. And also, the question itself, whether or not Jesus could heal on the Sabbath, the question itself hinges on the authority of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had the authority that he claimed, then he could do this. If he did not have the authority that he claimed, he could not. Plain and simple. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. He didn't name Jesus. He just said, He who made me whole. He probably didn't even know who he was, at least by name. He had been ordered to do it. He did it, in other words. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk. Who was that man that told you this? What man is this who said, take up your bed and walk? Uh, there's a contrast here between human authority and divine authority. The Jews are asking the right question. They're asking the right question. What man is that? Who was that man that said this? But it was from improper motives. They really didn't want to know the answer to this. They just simply asked it to try to gain the identity of Jesus so they could then go and persecute him. And he that was healed knew not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Jesus had passed on. He simply healed the man and left. Again, highlighting his power over what was going on in that place. He did not want to excite a crowd. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. That's an interesting statement that Jesus makes to him. Sin no more. That suggests that this man's sickness or illness or malady was possibly in part traceable to sin. Now we know that just because somebody is sick doesn't, or, or ill doesn't mean that they are in sin or have been in sin. But there are some illnesses and some maladies that are traceable to sinful practices. So apparently this man had to be encouraged not to go back into what he had done before lest a worse thing, Jesus says, happen to you. And so verse 15 the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Now, this man is not betraying Jesus by any means. He's honoring him. He thinks that they really, sincerely want to know who it was that healed him. So he goes right back to the Jews and tells them it was Jesus that had done this. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. This is the first open mention of the persecution of the Jews against Jesus, the Jewish leaders. From this moment, they begin to conspire against him. They perceive Jesus as a threat to their authority, as a threat to their positions of power. And verse 17, Jesus answered them, My father worketh there hitherto, and I work. My Father works, and I work. If Jesus is merely a man, he would be condemned. But if he is divine, then he's fully justified. Jesus appeals to the one who has all authority, God. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father making himself equal with God. Now, again, this all hinges on the authority of Jesus. 
Some of my brethren today want to say, well, you see, Jesus disobeyed the law, so we can, well, he didn't disobey the law. Jesus was above the law. He is the one who gave the law to Moses in the first place. He denied that the law was authority over him, in essence. Jesus was the authority. Of course, his authority came from God. But he himself had authority over the law since he was the one who had given it to Moses on Sinai. So, he also said that God was his father. If he was a mere man, again, this would be blasphemous. But yet, it was not. Because Jesus had already proven by his deeds that he was more than just a man. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, and here we go, this is what's going to start this section that I was talking about at the very beginning of all that Jesus says, the fascinating words that Jesus utters, the fascinating concepts and the, the logical progression of all the things he's going to say, it begins right here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus appeals first to unity of action between the Father and the Son. They have unity of action. And then, verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. So a second is unity of love and a commitment, a commitment and plan. There's a unity then of action, unity of love, verse 21, for as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth or makes alive whom he wills. There's a unity of impartation. Number three, verse 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Fourth, unity in judgment. There's a unity between the Father and the Son that exists. Here's the reason that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. All of this unity that he's described, unity of action, unity of love, unity in life impartation, and unity in judgment results in unity of honor. A unity of honor. And he also says, that it is right to receive divine honor from men since he is the son because of his own position. Verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation or judgment, but is passed from death unto life. So, Jesus has the authority to execute life and death judgment over men. Now, many of our religious friends come to John chapter 5, verse 24, and they'll say, you see, we only must hear and believe in Jesus, and then we will have everlasting life. That's what you got to do. Just like John 3, 16. They'll appeal to John 3, 16. All you got to do is believe. John 5, 24. All you've got to do is hear and believe. But they completely overlook what Jesus had already told Nicodemus in John 3, 5. Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It ignores a passel of other New Testament scriptures which clearly indicate the connection between immersion, baptism, and salvation. If you deny that, you're denying clear scripture. And yet that's what many of our religious neighbors seem to want to do. Romans 8, 1 indicates that we must obey, that we must do the will, uh, the follow the Spirit's will. In this sense, belief, hearing and believing is with a look towards obedience. Because Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 plainly says, Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered, and me made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. To deny that passage is to deny clear New Testament teaching. So you've got to take this in context. And what the New Testament says about salvation and what to do to be saved in clear context. We can't isolate one scripture or two scriptures away from everything else that is plain about what one must do to be saved. 
We continue on, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Jesus has the power of life impartation to men, both physically and spiritually. Here we see this live with a view towards not only physical life, but most importantly, spiritual life. He has that power, that authority. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. This is all executed according to the will of God. And Jesus is experienced in what we do and what we have gone through. And he has lived as man. Jesus has been given this authority because he is, notice, the son of man. There's that title again that Jesus uses. His favorite title that he uses for himself, the son of man, which has the messianic overtones, clear messianic overtones with it. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming into which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. These two verses, John 5, 28 and 29, blow away so many denominational teachings concerning the second coming. First and foremost, it blows away this theory that there's going to be a rapture. Have you heard about the rapture, supposedly? Have you seen the bumper stickers that say, in case of rapture, this car will be unoccupied? Have you seen the uh, movies or heard about the movies and the books written about the rapture, supposedly? Well, folks, let me tell you, not only is the word rapture never used in the New Testament, the concept is not found in the New Testament either. This modern-day conception of a so-called rapture where there's going to be some invisible coming of Jesus and invisible, it has nothing to do with what the New Testament teaches. Notice what Jesus said. The hour is coming. The hour. Not thousands upon thousands of years. That is to say there's going to be a first resurrection, then a time space of about a thousand years or so, and then another resurrection or some kind of dispensational premillennial uh, construct. That's not what Jesus is saying. The hour is coming into which all, notice this, all that are in the graves, that's both righteous and unrighteous, that's not part, not most, but all, shall hear his voice and shall come Forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That is so clear. You'd have to have help to misunderstand it. And yet you've got so many denominational preachers and denominational teachers and so many good people in religious groups and some of our own brethren that willingly want to misunderstand these two verses or even ignore them altogether. Because what the New Testament teaches concerning the second coming of Jesus and the events of the second coming are crystal clear. All that are in the graves. Not going to be one resurrection and then a separation of a uh, thousand years or so and then another resurrection. It's going to be all at once. But yet, not only is the rapture theory blown away, this 80-70 theory that says that this really doesn't refer to what it says. This is not really a resurrection of the living and the, uh, of the uh, righteous and unrighteous dead. It's really referring to when Titus came with his Roman armies to Jerusalem in AD 70 and ransacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. That's when the second coming took place. That's when the final resurrection took place. That's when the final judgment took place. That is absolutely ludicrous. 
And to our friends who are watching this or are going to be watching this on video, yes, I said it, absolutely ludicrous. That is our friends who advocate the 80-70 theory. They try to, try to make a complete concrete connection or a, a hard and fast connection between Daniel 12, 1 and 2 by saying, well, what Daniel said in Daniel 12, 1 and 2 was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So ipso facto, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. You can't separate it. Well, number one... Is it talking in Daniel 12, 1 and 2 about the destruction of Jerusalem? Or is it talking about something else? That's the first question to ask. Second thing is, when Jesus makes it clear in the language that he uses here in John 5, 28 and 29, are we to say that words don't mean things? Are we then to adopt what I would call a Humpty Dumpty hermeneutic and say that when a word, uh, when I choose a word, it means what I choose it to mean nothing more, nothing less? Or is what Jesus is saying clear? Jesus is clearly saying what he intended to say. All that are in the graves. Not in the graves of Judaism. No. All that are in the graves. All who are dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Not coming forth out of the grave of Jewish persecution. No, out of the graves. And they will go to a resurrection of life and a resurrection of condemnation. That's what Jesus is saying. And to deny that is to deny clear teaching. Yes, sir. Some do. Uh, the question is, if you take all of what Jesus says, just isolate what Jesus actually says. Can you then take what Jesus says and manipulate it? Well, again, some try to do that. And they either ignore what Jesus says on, clearly on, on certain things, or they will try to twist what Jesus says into something he didn't say. Uh, which, of course, has been ta happening since the first century, really. But yeah, that, people do that. They'll take what Jesus says about certain subjects such as the second coming, clear words, clear teaching, and yet they'll say, well, you know, he actually meant this. Instead of taking what Jesus actually says. Now, there is an occasion where Jesus will use words that mean other things, but he himself indicates that in parables and in and different things that he says, which he later explains to his disciples or is explained by the gospel writers. But when it's just simple narrative, simple, straightforward teaching that Jesus gives, then how in the world can we then take that, what Jesus says, and manipulate it and try to twist it around to say, well, he really didn't say this, he meant this. People do that. People try to do that all the time uh, with various teachings that Jesus made. So, yeah, that's a good question. There are so many that do that, and that's unfortunate. And too many of my own brethren are doing that too. Uh, I could go on and on, but we've got less than five minutes left. Yes, sir. If the question was asked for those who couldn't hear. If, if what I said about this pool in the uh, early part of chapter 5 is the case, that it was an Asclepion, a pagan pool, what ramifications, what implications is there in that? Well, I think, number one, you've got the presence of Jesus himself performing a great miracle, a, a miracle which cannot be denied in the midst of what's supposedly going on. And the very act of Jesus doing this goes into the strong man's house, in essence, and binds the strong man. In other words, he doesn't do that completely, obviously, in this occasion. But it works toward that end. In other words, he's demonstrating his power over the power of Satan, over the power of man. And so if that is the case, if this is true, I'm not saying it is completely, I'm just saying this is what my conviction is on it, then this really demonstrates Jesus' power over paganism. 
And uh, for us, it demonstrates Jesus' power over pagan theories today. That was a good question. We might get in back into that if we want to next Sunday for a, for a minute or two <laughs> to flesh it out even more. Uh, you can take that for what it's worth about what I said about the pool and take it or leave it. Uh, if it was what the scribes who added verse 4 describe it to be, then it's still superstition. It's something that, of course, the Bible doesn't clearly teach, or the Old Testament didn't clearly teach, and it's something that was tradition. It was elevated to the level of truth by those who believed in it. And again, Jesus is demonstrating his power over that. So either way, you've got Jesus demonstrating his power over human philosophy. Or either way you look at it, the uh, way I see it at least. But it's interesting. I've written a paper about that, a detailed paper about the Asclepians, uh, and about the god Asclepius and about this possible connection to it, um, I find it fascinating. Most people probably wouldn't, but it's fascinating to me at least. Well, we'll leave it here, and we'll take up with our study.